Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to A Shot of Inspiration. And today we are here with Greg Stevens, your host. My name is Josh Tapp. I am here to really just get to know Greg and see where he came from, where he's going, what they're trying to do here with this amazing show. And I'm so excited to support him here in this podcast. So Greg, say what's up to everybody and we'll hop in. Hi, everyone. Glad to have you on my first episode. Thanks for being here. (laughs) <laughs> so excited to get this one going, Greg. Honestly, the this podcast has come from, it sounds like years and years of experience in public speaking and helping people break mental barriers and become more successful in all areas of their life. And I'm I'm so excited to to A, help people get inspiration, but but B, I really want them to get that inspiration from your story first, right? Because you're going to be talking to so many amazing people, having incredible guests, sharing your wisdom. But I really want to know, like, where did you come from, Greg? Okay. Humble beginnings. Let's hear it. (laughs) Well, uh, I was actually born in Amarillo, Texas, and uh, we moved to Oklahoma City just outside when I was very young. Lived uh, next to my grandparents uh, on a country farm with five acres of garden. So uh, we had a lot of work. I grew up working really hard uh, where most kids were actually playing in uh, uh, on a street, going to a swimming pool during the summer. I'm out pulling weeds and, uh, you know, doing farm work and uh, helping with my grandfather's sign business. Uh, I was pretty much a full-time worker and um, a gopher <laughs> when I was growing up until I was probably about 12 years old. And so uh, my father uh, uh, early on was a kind of a hellraiser, but in the military, went off to Vietnam, came back uh, when I was five, a very different man. And I'll talk a little about my father mine's relationship later. But uh, uh, my dad, when he came back, became uh, kind of pendulum swung the other way. And he became an old time Southern Baptist hellfire and brimstone, walk him walk up and down the aisle preacher. So that's kind of the vision of my dad. And uh, it was almost uh, many times kind of very harsh. And uh, then we moved back to Texas and we moved to a lot of little towns in East Texas, West Texas. So I moved every year to two years growing up and was put in small towns and uh, moved to another small town. And then, then we moved out to West Texas. And then I finally moved to a uh, little town outside of Dallas called Seagoville, which is uh, just outside of Dallas and uh, graduated from high school there, ended up later going to Baylor University, getting out, working in Houston, then to Austin, uh, was a pharmaceutical rep for many years. And then um, along that pathway, I started taking classes in human development, human behavior, human potential, uh, psychology, sociology, and did some work with a company called Landmark Education, did a lot of their uh, courses, and eventually outgrew my job and decided to start my own uh, training and development company, uh, doing executive coaching, things like that. I went off on my own in 1999 and started a uh, relationship company. I used to teach man-woman relationship courses to the public. And then in 2001, I Uh, ran into some gentlemen who wrote a book called Crucial Conversations. Uh, They hadn't actually written the book yet, but they had the training. And I uh, took the training. They allowed me to come in and work, uh, keep my independent status, but sell and teach their programs. And as they grew, my business grew. And I've been teaching uh, Crucial Conversations, uh, that format, since 2001. So I teach a master certified in Crucial Conversations, Crucial Accountability, Influencer, Change Anything, and the Power of Habit with Crucial Learning. And I've just started my uh, second business called Alignment Resources. And what we're doing is putting uh, a lot of different programs together after people have had those foundational programs with Crucial Learning, we're looking at how we can add on. Like we have a masterful mentorship, teaching mentors how to connect quickly with their um, with their with their mentees. So teaching mentors how to connect with their mentees, and then also uh, we have things a uh, class called Master Storytelling. We have some diversity, equity, inclusion classes in there. And we've also even got a program where a friend of mine he goes into companies and. Uh, uh, 
creates team building with creating a corporate song for the organization that the organization creates together. So those are some of the things I'm doing now, but my real passion, and I'm also a professional mediator. I've got my mediation uh, a certification along the way. And uh, I've been teaching thousands of people through the years, the skill sets and all those programs on the road. And last couple of years after um, COVID, I've been doing mostly virtual training since then. But uh, my passion is helping people have stronger, better relationships uh, uh, and cleaning up those. I'm actually working on finishing a book right now called Restoration, Cleaning Up Relationships That Matter. And it's all about going and having a fuller life and deeper relationships with people, whether they're family members or whether people you work with or even cleaning up things that didn't work in the past so you can just let them go. So that's what I've been doing over the last several years. <laughs> I, I love it. Well, and, and I want to ask you this too, Greg, because do you feel like your relationship with your father was like the motivating factor for working with like through Crucial Conversations and, and working with them or... I'm just kind of yeah, curious well, what that was. Absolutely. It was a cornerstone around a lot of the work I do. Um, I Years ago, I, uh, I remember I dated a woman who actually, she was friends with all her ex-boyfriends. I was like, that just seems weird to me. I, I was not friends with any of mine and uh, I couldn't understand it. And she always was hopeful that I could go clean those up. And I just never wanted to see those people again. After I took some courses, started looking at my life, I saw how that was weighting me down. But one of the problems is I didn't know how to go back. And I, some of the programs I went to, they always talked about cleaning up relationships. So I didn't know how. When I took the Crucial Conversations courses, I started to understand how to do it. It's a skill set of how to have those. Most of the organizations would tell you, oh, go have these conversations. And sometimes they would go well. Many times they wouldn't for the person. And that it would actually create a greater rift. So I'll just kind of share one of the stories that I have. And it's about my father. And I usually tell it now at the end of my class. But when I first started doing this work, I... Uh, decided to go, had a harebrained idea, go clean up all my past relationships. <laughs> and so I told my mom and she kind of laughed. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm going to go. If, if there's someone I was walking down a hall and I wanted to move into a room so I didn't have to see them, that was a relationship I needed to clean up. So I had a list of 36 people I needed to clean up relationships with. And uh, on that list, I had old bosses, old colleagues, old direct reports, a couple of uh, uh, roommates from college, a couple of college professors, a uh, ton of ex-girlfriends, uh, two ex-wives. So on the list, I had a whole slew of people. It took me nearly two and a half years. Well, I told my mom, I said, I'm going to go clean these up. She goes, well, I want to hear the stories. I said, okay. So I'd call her up and tell her some of the stories and we kind of laugh about it. She was always there for me. And if I hadn't talked to, told her a story in a while, she goes, you still work on the list? I say, yeah, I just haven't run into anyone. So fast forward about two and a half years. Um, I called my mom. I said, mom, I'm having my next, my last conversation the, tomorrow with my old boss in Houston. And she said, call me as soon as you're done. Cause she kind of knew the background with my father so it was one of those conversations. It was one and done. It was uh, very powerful. My old boss said he really uh, respected me for having the conversation. I came out to the parking lot after it was over, called my mom, said, hey, it went great. She said, well, you said it's your next to your last conversation. Who's your last conversation with? I said, it's dad. And she said, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> and she's been my uh, rah-rah person for all these years. But my, and my parents had the best marriage I've ever seen because they were a real team, but mom knew I couldn't have the conversation with dad and it go well. And I said, mom, you know, I have to, I can't be a hypocrite in front of people asking them to clean up their lives if I'm not willing to do it myself. And she said, son, those people don't know your dad. I'll never see you again. <laughs> and she was serious. Uh, let me give you a little background on my father. Like I said, my father early on was a hellraiser. And when he went off to Vietnam, he came back, he left when I was four, came back when I was five, very differently. About a year after that, my dad became an old time Southern Baptist, 
again, hellfire and brimstone, walk up and down, down the aisle, screaming type minister. And some people understand that, but some people don't know how extreme it can get. We lived in one town in deep East Texas. We're about 20 miles from the nearest grocery store, which was in a little town called Nacogdoches. Well, my dad would go into Nacogdoches. They had a public library and sometimes he would actually check out books and records and burn them on the steps of the Nacogdoches public library saying this doesn't need to be out there. So that's kind of where my dad was. And when I decided to go to college, I decided to go to Baylor University. My dad, you think it's a Baptist school, think he'd be happy. He was upset because he felt Baylor was too wild. <laughs> now, I don't know if you know anything about Baylor. It's not wild at all. But uh, uh, I was putting myself through. So I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go where I want to go. And uh, one example of how extreme it was, when I was a junior, my dad called me up. I only saw my parents a couple times a year. My dad calls me up and says, son, you need to come home this weekend. I said, what are you talking about? It's middle semester. I'm not coming home. It's a six and a half hour drive. And he said, well, we need you here. We're meeting with a lawyer on Saturday. I said, what do you mean you're meeting with a lawyer? He said, we're disowning your sister and we need you. I said, back up. What are you talking about? I said, what's going on with Wendy? And he said, well, she's dating a guy who has a terrible reputation. And we found out we think she's drinking beer and alcohol. And we know we can't have that in the family. Well, at Baylor, I've become quite the partier. So I wasn't going to talk about my alcohol consumption, but I felt like I owed it to my sister to go down and try to talk them out of it. Well, I went down and I was successful. We, I, we had an amazing conversation and they decided not to go that route. But how safe do you think it was for me to talk about my life now? It wasn't, but I'll be honest, I was never going to talk to my dad about it anyway, because we weren't close at all. I'll be honest, I, I really didn't like him. Didn't want to be around him. So now fast forward from there, we're to the point back where my mom was uh, talking to me. I said, mom, you know, I have to have the conversation with dad. And she said, well, if it helps, let him know I've known the entire time. I said, mom, I'm not going to throw you under the bus. She said, if it keeps you in my life, let him know. I said, well, give him the phone. Picks up the phone and said, hey, dad, it's your son. Because I never really talked to him on the phone. He said, hey. I said, dad, I live, I uh, bought a home in Austin and sold it. And you've never even seen that. I said, why don't you come in? I had a roommate at the time. I said, my roommate's going to be uh, gone for an entire week. Why don't we, you come in and let's get to know each other. And he lit up. He said, oh, that'd be great. So I'll never forget two weeks later, he comes in and that car pulls up. My stomach just starts turning because I know I got to have the conversation. I thought I'll come down. I'll have the conversation tonight. So he comes in, it's awkward. We don't know really how to talk to each other. So he kind of gets up in the attic up there. I go in the living room. He comes back down, goes into the kitchen. And all of a sudden I had this flash. I forgot to get something out of the refrigerator. And I hear the refrigerator door open and I hear this scream. Whose beer is this in here? You shouldn't have a roommate that drinks. And Josh, I'm telling you in that moment, I was five years old again, and I nearly blamed it on my roommate. But before I could get it out of my mouth, my dad said, you don't let alcohol pass the plane of your front door. I taught you better than this. I'll stay an extra day. When he gets here, we'll kick him out together. I said, dad, calm down. He said, I'm not going to calm down. I said, dad, that's my beer. I've been drinking since I was a sophomore at Baylor. Sit down. I need to tell you something. And I told him everything. You wouldn't tell the most liberal parent in the world, let alone the most conservative. And after about 15 minutes, he just said, stop. But he was crying. He was bawling. He was in tears. And he looked at me, he said, son, I know what you're doing. I will always love you. But I do not like you. Do not like the man you become. You're a hypocrite and a liar. And I don't care if I ever see your face again. And when he said that, Josh, something snapped in me and I had a repressed memory. And I'd overheard years ago, my sister and mom talking about something my dad had done his entire life that he preached against. And it flashed in my head. and I nearly grabbed that and threw it at it. But if I would have done that, we would have gotten to what we call a downward spiral. We might never have gotten out. But with my training, we ask ourselves questions. And in that moment, I asked myself, 
what is it I really want for myself? And in that moment, even preparing, I didn't realize. In that moment, I realized I really did want a real relationship with my dad. I'd never been honest about that. And also in that moment, what did I want for him? Well, I wanted my dad to see me for who I was, not the things I had done. I'd like our relationship to get repaired and I'd like our family to heal. Once I got my motives in the right place, next question we ask is, how am I responsible for this whole thing happening? And you know what? My dad was right. I was a hypocrite. Many times we'd go in someone's home and I'd say, oh, did you see they had beer over there? They had wine over there acting like I didn't do it. And why would a reasonable, another question we ask is, why would a reasonable, rational, decent person do what my father just did? Well, from his belief system, he feels like a failure in this moment as my father and as my minister. And then the final question we ask ourselves to turn our brains on is, what should I do right now to move toward what I really want? What action do I take? And my brain came back on and it, here's what came out of my mouth. I looked at my dad and said, dad, you're right. I'm a hypocrite to you. Wendy, my sister knows what I do. Mom knows what I do. All my friends know I love to party. I said, I've kept it from you because I was worried you would want to disown me. I can see I was right. And that's not what I want. I said, dad, you've always been a man of your word. I can see you're ready to walk out the door right now, but you've always been a man of your word. You said you'd stay a week. Give me just three more days. But if you stay those three days, we have to talk about everything we've kept from each other. So if we never see each other again in this lifetime, at least we will know who we were to each other. And my dad looks at me, starts still crying, stands up, puts his hands on his hips, his son. I'll give you the three days. Then it's not going to make a difference. Then I never want to see you again. I can't look at you right now. You make me sick turns around, walks out and slams the door. <laughs> so how was that for my having that conversation? It was terrible. And I sat there shaking for probably the next hour or so. And my dad walks back in after about an hour, slams the door. Okay, let's do this talking thing. So that's my audience. But over the next three days, we talked about everything that we kept from each other. He told me about things that happened in Vietnam things he never shared with anyone else. And Josh, it wasn't things he had done, but was things he had seen. And I understood for the first time what PTSD is really all about. It finally made sense, but he also got to see what that did with me and our family dynamic. And we got close and we got closer. And over the next three days, I can't tell you, it was the first time I connected with my dad. I was so happy. I also was so mad that I'd waited to, for him to be the last person two and a half years. I thought I just wasted so much time. Woke up on Thursday morning, come out of my room, thinking my dad's going to stay. And he's standing at the door with his luggage. He said, I told you I was ready to go after three days. Whole attitude reverted back to day one and my heart sunk. I went, okay. So I walked him out to his car. He throws his luggage in the, in the trunk, closes it, turns, looks me dead in the eye, doesn't say a word. He gets in his car, drives away, and he dies three years later. And why do I share that story with people? Because I tell people all the time, I'm not on the line for your crucial conversations or your conversations, whatever they may be. I'm on the line for mine. And in that moment, even though I knew deep down I'd done the right thing and I did my best, it was no solace for the pain I felt. But I also found out that day you have no idea what can happen when you tru truthfully speak your when you speak your truth respectfully, because that car stopped about halfway down the street, backed up, pulled in. Dad gets out, he's crying, runs to me, grabs me, bear hugs me, and says, "Son, I love you and I like you." I like the man you become. He said, honestly, I always wanted you to be a preacher. You like the party way too much for that. He said, I'll always be on you about the alcohol because you know it ruined my family. I said, dad, you didn't really tell me the depth of that until this weekend. He said, can we start this relationship you're talking about? I said, what do you want? He said, come see me in two weeks. And I knew what he meant because 
I would go home and I'd only really spend time with mom. I said, dad, I'll come home and see you in two weeks. Two weeks later, first thing he says, you're not still drinking beer, are you? <laughs> that one conversation is going to handle it. But I, my dad was a hugger. I walked up to him. I hugged him. And I said, dad, if alcohol ever becomes a problem for me, would you just be a rock and help me out? He said, yeah, really never brought it up again. And it was interesting because we started that relationship, and about six months after, I decided I'd like to tell our story in front of class, but I need his permission. So I said, Dad, I'd like to tell our story to my classes. He goes, what story? And I said, well, here's our story. I'd like to, and the first thing he says after I share it with him, the first thing he said, son, I'm not that way anymore. And how I start my classes is you have no ability to change anyone else in your life. The only person you have the ability to change is yourself. But what I found, if you change how you do things, other people may have to change how they engage with you. And that's what happened with my father and I. And it was a give and take. But before my dad passed away, he became one of my best friends. And I owe that to all the work that I've done. And it really is amazing to be able to say I completed that and it had me it was my focus point, but it was my last deep, crucial conversation around cleaning up my past. So that's one of the reasons I do the work I do. I share that story in most of my classes, and I hear people all the time. It inspires them to go clean up some of theirs. A lot of people have that difficult father relationship or maybe a spouse or something like that. I believe we, when our relationships are strong, we tend to do really well in our lives. And I think that's, we. none of us does it alone and we all need those strong relationships. And if they're not strong, it's kind of up to us to go clean them up if we don't. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate you sharing that story. That is a very deep story and I appreciate you sharing that. They're gonna love that, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure there's a story like that for many of those other people on that list as well that were, were deep. I mean, obviously the, the paternal relationship is the one that, that cuts the deepest a lot of times for sure. But I hope those of you listening to this show, I hope that inspires you to say, who is that person? You know, like, like it was for you, Greg, like who was the father that I need to actually reach out to and, and have that conversation with. And so I, I appreciate you sharing that. Thanks. And I, I want to ask you this, Greg, um, why, why a podcast? Why, why did you all of a sudden start to, or decide to start a podcast and, and start sharing the message this way? Well, two things on that end. Uh, right at the beginning of COVID, uh, well, let's back up a little before that. A friend of mine, Dan Mormon, and I, we always kind of go out and sip tequila on the weekends and uh, just talk about philosophy, spirituality, and God. And uh, We talked about what could we put out there, and we thought a shot of inspiration because we've been sipping tequila. <laughs> that was always the thought. But then right at the beginning of COVID, uh, my wife and I were walking uh, around the neighborhood and I was really in an ugly, negative space and complaining about everything. And she just stops. And this is before we'd gotten married. She said, Greg, she goes, I've never heard you talk like this. She said, you're hopeless right now. I can't be with someone who's hopeless. And it woke me up. It was like, oh, my gosh, when we start looking at all the things in the world that are going wrong, if we stay focused on that, it's going to feel hopeless. But if we can start looking at something more inspiring, it can change our complete view. And my old business partner, Hayden Hayden, used to say, uh, where focus goes, energy flows. So if you focus on the negative, the negative is going to show up. So if you focus on all the things that are happening in the world, I mean, look at the politics, look at the Ukraine, look at all the stuff that's happening, global warming, all those things. I don't have an ability to change any of that except at my minute level. But what I can do focusing on those things doesn't help. Looking at it, something that inspires me does. It gives me energy to do something better. It gives me energy to go and be kind to that person and try to find a solution rather than, you know, drawing lines that divide us. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to get this information out there just so it gives people relief from 
the pain that's going on out there. Let's look at something inspiring, someone who's had a breakthrough because they're out there everywhere. I think everyone's had them, but they're not even seeing them sometimes because they're not asking themselves the right questions. So you ending on that, right, of, of finding the right questions. What are those right questions for the people who are listening to the show? What are some of the questions they need to be asking themselves? Hmm. Well, first, how am I responsible? <laughs> I think that's the first thing we have to look at. Uh, that's the only thing I can tr control. And what I find so often was, and I'll say this because I would, had a victim mentality for years before I did any of this work. Most people see my life and say, wow, he's successful. I was miserable. I was a victim around most anything that happened. And that's why I can spot it so quick. We tell people, if you spot it, you got it. Okay. You see that thing. And what I really, I can pick those things up because that's my natural self. I'm a victim. I play, I used to play that role, but I also found out there's a way you can get out of that. And it's, uh, there's a mantra I live my life by now, whether it's true or not, it's an amazing way to live. Everything in my life, I create, promote, or allow. That's total responsibility. Now, some people say, well, how about the spiritual realm? That's a different conversation. But I'm talking about everything in my life that's shown up. I created it, I promoted it, or I allowed it. When I take responsibility at that level, then I can begin to make change. But all it is, it's a shift in mindset. It doesn't change your circumstances. It just changes your mindset. And when we change our mindset, we can change our feelings. We can change our results. It's truly our own uh, human superpower that we do have. You see all these DC comics and all the you know superheroes. We all have this thing within us. We have the ability to change what we tell ourselves and get out of that victim role, victim role to be able to do more powerful things that we're meant for. Well, and, and what do you hope to, to like, what's the result you hope to provide to somebody who listens to this show? I mean, they're going to come here, they're going to hear the inspiration, but what's, what's the result you're hoping to provide them? I really want to light their candle. <laughs> Think <laughs> about every person has a, a light within them. I just want to help light that so they can be themselves. I believe no matter if someone, you know, what, what their belief system is, I believe we can we're, we're meant to shine. We're meant to cause a light out there. We're meant to be ourselves. And how can I be my best self? That's what I really want to ask people. How can you be your best self? And no one else can do it for you. The circumstances or other people aren't going to put you there. You're going to have to find that space within you to do that. But I also find when you find that, life's going to have a whole different color around it. It really does. It's, it's more vibrant. Does it mean your problems are gone? Heck no. You might even feel like you have more at times, but they don't control you. You can begin to uh, write the narrative on what you're doing based on what you're, you're dealing with inside your head, what you're telling yourself. Look at again, look at the positive. Don't look at why you can't do something. That's one thing most people do. You ask them to do something. They'll tell you 10, 15 reasons, reasons why they can't. Let's go on a trip. Oh no, I've got this, 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 and this. Why don't you tell me why you can't or what you would get out of it? So let's start looking at that part of life because that's what creates the breakthroughs. And I believe there's breakthroughs for everyone to have. They're just out there waiting for us, but we have to be able to engage with them rather than try to avoid them. One of the things most people try to do, they try to avoid conflict. Well, I'm going to suggest if you avoid conflict, you're avoiding your breakthrough. You don't get to have a breakthrough until there's conflict, hence the word breakthrough. You've got to break through something. But if you avoid that conflict, you avoid your breakthrough. And we want to play it safe. I don't think anyone goes to their deathbed thing. Wow, I'm really glad I played it safe. I think what most of us would say, I'd, lo I'd love to peek out over the edge a little more, uh, push it a little more. And, uh, but also in doing that, do it respectfully. Consider it's not just me, it's we. And that's just it. So many people are so self-centered now. We need to be a we-centered group. If we could actually begin to shift that, I think we'd shift all kinds of things. And I want to inspire that because none of us, again, makes it alone. But how can you put that energy into the things that work rather than looking at the things that don't? 
Well, Greg, I think that was some fantastic advice and I appreciate you letting me come on and share this, this first episode experience with you. But I want to ask you one final question just to wrap this interview up, which is what's, what's one, what are your final thoughts for your audience here? And like the parting piece of guidance that you could give them. Hmm. Um, I guess it would be, there's a breakthrough waiting for you. <laughs> there is, uh, you know, it's not hopeless. It, it, we are meant to overcome. That's the human spirit. We're, we're meant to do more than what we see in front of us. Most of us want to be comfortable. I mean, I'm at the age, most of my friends are trying to actually go get into retirement. I don't want to ever retirement. I've actually started a new business, started my podcast. I'm doing all this right now because I believe I don't want, uh, I'm not looking for retirement. I'm looking at what we can contribute. That's where life is lived. And if people want to retire, that's great. But do something with that time that's going to help others. Because I find my old coach, John Catalina, used to tell me, Greg, get yours in the giving. Give out. I promise you, you, you'll always get back. It may not be the same thing that you think right now, but it will feed your soul. And I find that we need inspiration. That's why I want to put this out there. I've met inspiring people. When you hear some of their stories, you're going to connect. Other people, you won't connect at all. They just don't connect with you. But I believe throughout the, the, the next years to come, some people will find amazing breakthroughs, not just for themselves personally, but for their relationship with their kids, their spouse, even their parents as they age. How can we make sure we're living powerfully in what we do have? Again, everything in my life I create, promote, or allow. So what am I putting out there in the world as I'm getting old, uh, older and have more insight as I've been doing this for many years?